1 John chapter number 4, it's a very powerful chapter of the Bible. Amen. And really, just 1 John in general is a very important chapter of the Bible, especially for saved believers. It's, a, it's a written for believers. It's written for the church. And it has so much application, and there's so much doctrine in this book. And I think it's one of the most twisted books when it comes to other churches. It comes to, a lot of false doctrine will come out of this book. And especially if you look at the modern versions today, they twist so many scriptures in the book of 1 John just to try and reconcile with all their different false doctrines. Like the doctrines of lordship salvation, of repenting of your sins, of, of trying to work your way to heaven. They twist so many different verses and they, they get all kind of things messed up. But we believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word without error. Amen. That's why we use this. And if we understand that this is God's word and we understand His words here, we'll get all of our doctrine right. We'll get it all straight. We can just believe what it says and know that it's right. Yep. Now, I'm not going to focus on salvation necessarily for the sermon. I want to focus on verse number 3. It says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where have you heard that it should come? And even now, already is it in the world. And the title of the sermon tonight is Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Right. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Now there's a lot of application to just that simple phrase. And some people, I think even for myself, the first few times you read through this, it kind of seems confusing. Because you think, well, I mean, the Roman Catholics, they would confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. I mean, the Methodists will claim that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. I mean, virtually all Christianity, for the most part, I mean, will say Jesus Christ came in the flesh. So is this saying that they're all saved? That they're all of God? No, that's not what the Bible's saying here. But let's get an understanding. What is the book of 1 John saying? Who is, the, who is that even written to? Go to the very first ch uh, chapter and look at verse 1 there for a second. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So there in verse 4, he tells us one of the reasons why this book's written. That our joy could be full. He's talking to the same. He's talking to those that believe on Jesus Christ. He's talking to the church. And he wants you to have a full faith. And notice, he wants us to have fellowship with both the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. If you look at uh, chapter number 2 now. Look at verse 1. We're going to see there's some different reasons why he's writing this book, but they all kind of tie together. Look at verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, who is the ye? He says that ye sin not. Is it this book just written to tell unbelievers not to sin? I mean, is the point of this book to just go rebuke the world, to be a street preacher, to go out and just preach and rip on their sin? No, he's talking to save people. Hey, you need to not sin. I've written these things. Why? So that you won't sin. So you your joy can be full. Look at verse 12 now. It says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Now, could you say that about an unbeliever? No. Could you say that about a Roman Catholic? No. no. Nope. You can't say that about anybody that hasn't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that hasn't believed the gospel. He's talking to the saved. He's talking to a church that believes the gospel. He says, hey, your sins are forgiven you, little children. Look at verse 13. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. Verse 14, I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So he's saying, look, the kids in this church I'm saying are saved, the young men are saved, the old men. I mean, he's talking to a church of saved believers. And I'm driving this point in because it makes us understand this book better. But look at 1 John chapter 3 now. Look at verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now, is everybody a son of God? No. Nope. False doctrine. No. But is 
many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. How do you become a son of God? By receiving Jesus Christ, by believing on Jesus Christ, right. by accepting his free gift. Now are we the sons of God. He's talking to people that have believed. Look at verse 13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. He's calling them brethren. Look at verse, uh, go back to chapter 4, look at verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Look at verse 13 of chapter 5, very famous verse. These things have I written unto you that what? Believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know the eternal life, and they may believe on the name of the Son of God. Look at verse 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. So is it, it, I mean, this book couldn't be clearer that he's writing to same people that have believed on Jesus Christ, okay? And there's a few different themes through the book of 1 John. One is the fact that he's writing that our joy could be full, that we wouldn't sin. Another major theme is the fact that we're supposed to love our brethren. We're supposed to love our brother in Christ. We're supposed to love all those that are saved. But there's another theme that's prevalent through the book of 1 John, and it's the fact that there's many deceivers, there's many antichrists. There's many people that will come in and they will deceive you. And what's the point of them telling the, to the church? Because they're going to be of you. They're going to be in your church. There's going to be deceivers and antichrists in your church. And you say, well, how in the world would I know that I have a deceiver in my church? Well, let's go back to 1 John chapter 4 now. Let's start there in verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out of the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where have you heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So he's saying, look, when you're in a group of a, of a church that all believes the right gospel, that is the clear doctrine being preached, you can still have a false brethren. What's one of the ways that you can figure that out? If they don't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. I mean, they might say, hey, I believe in Jesus. Hey, I believe what you did. But they don't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Now, there's a lot of people, they would say this statement. They would say, oh, I believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh. But they actually don't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh according to the Bible. Why? Because they have another Jesus. Because when they say Jesus, they mean something different than what the Bible means by Jesus Christ. And you know what that person doesn't believe? They don't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. They're changing their definitions. This is the, the true thing about most false prophets is they will say true statements, but they don't really mean them. They're with feigned words. Or they change the definition of certain words. They'll say, yeah, you just have to believe on Jesus Christ to be saved, but we know that believe means obey. Right. We know that believe means you've got to follow the commandments and go to church and live a good life. That's not what believe means. No. They're changing the words. And so how can you find us a false brethren? It's when they don't really believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That's one of the ways. That's not the only way. And we see, what is that person? He's an antichrist. Now, antichrist does not mean against Christ. It means instead of and place up. They're changing who Jesus Christ really is with a different Christ. With a different Jesus. This sounds like, this could be a lot of different ways. We see, you know, the Mormons. If you go out and you knock the door, you find a Mormon, who do they believe? They say, oh, I believe in Jesus. They have another Jesus, though. That's right. Their Jesus Christ is a created being. Yep. Now, they do believe that he came down to this earth. They do believe that he came in the flesh. But it's another Jesus. They don't believe the right Jesus. Right. Now, how do we know who's the right Jesus? Back up to chapter 3 at the very end there. Look at verse 23. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. And he that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in Him, and He in Him. And hereby know that He abideth in us by the Spirit which He hath given us. So one of the indications here is He says, look, Jesus Christ is His Son. And then we back into what? We go right into chapter number 4. We said, believe, but don't believe every spirit. Hey, the people that are denying that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, they're not of God. They're an antichrist. They're a deceiver. Go if you would to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 14. Now the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, 
I'll read for you. It says, In journeyings often, and perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. The Bible warns the church that there will be false brethren in the church. That Paul suffered affliction because of false brethren. It says in Galatians 2, it says, And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now, of course, I believe 1 John chapter 4 can apply in a lot of different ways. We can look at this and say, hey, the Muslims, they're not saved because they just deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. They don't believe that he's God. They don't believe he's the Son of God. They're obviously anti-Christ. We see the Jews. They would deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. They're anti-Christ. But I think the primary context of 1 John is to discover the false brethren. Is to discover those that are these anti-Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means... As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if we receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted. Ye might well bear with him. So look, he pairs it up with what? Satan being subtle. Now, obviously, someone coming into the church claiming to believe the things that you do, claiming to be just like you, that's a lot of subtlety. That sounds like the serpent. And not only that, he says that uh, the believing in Christ is the simplicity that's in Christ. You know, believing on the gospel is simple. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is a simple truth. But we see these guys through subtlety will try to confuse that. They'll try to bring in a lot of confusion, a lot of deception. They'll try to make it more complicated than it really is. You know, it's not hard to believe that God gave His Son to die on the cross for us. It's not a hard doctrine to believe it. It's actually very simple. And you know, simple people believe that all over this world every single day and they're getting saved because it's the truth. It's easy to believe the truth because the truth is always simple. It's not hard. It's not complicated. It's not some difficult thing that has to be explained. Go back to 1 John. We're going to look a lot in 1 John. Look at 1 John chapter 2. It says in verse 18, I'll start reading. It says, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So he's saying, look, in the latter times, there's going to be Antichrists. They're already in the world. He says there are already all these Antichrists. But we see, you know, as the end times keep on going and it gets later and later, there's just going to be more Antichrists, more Antichrists, more of these false brethren. Look at verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that they were not all of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lies of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So we see one of the, the just signature signs of an Antichrist, he's denying the Son. And if you don't have the Son, then you don't have the Father. You don't have God. It's a package deal. You can't get one without the other. It makes me think of you, you know, you, you want to buy a... a a uh, laptop, okay, and let's say you want to get Apple's operating system. I really just want to get, you know, the OS X, you know, operating system. Well, guess what? You have to buy one of their hardwares. You have to buy their machine. You can't just get the software on an Apple machine. You have to buy the machine. It's a package deal. You can't have one without the other. It's kind of like a monopoly. And, you know, people even get sued over these type of things. Windows got sued over this one time because you couldn't buy a Windows machine without their software downloaded on it. It was just an automatic thing. Why? It's a package deal. You can't just, oh, I'll take some of Christ, but I don't want the Father. Or, hey, I want some of the Father, but I don't want Christ. No, it's a package deal. If you want one, you got to get both. you got to get them all. It's not this, you know, part here or part there. It's both. And we see, whosoever denied the Son, the same hath not the Father. Again, this applies in so many different contexts. It applies to the Jews most, you know, prevalently. The fact that they denied Jesus Christ and the fact that they don't have the Father. 
And it applies to anybody that would deny the Son. And we see one of these uh, tail marks of these false brethren is the fact when they would leave your church, leave a church that believes the gospel, leave a church that knows the truth, and go out and just start teaching rank heresy, just start teaching false things about the Son of God, proves they were false brethren. It's saying, look, if they had believed the right gospel, they would no doubt have continued preaching the right gospel. Yeah. I mean, in your mind, you know there's nothing that would stop you from going out and preaching like a false gospel. I mean, you're not going to go out and start preaching a false gospel. No. Yeah. You're not going to leave Faith Lord Baptist Church and start preaching, oh, you got to repent of your sins if you're saved. I mean, it's just never going to happen. Of course, people might get backslidden. Yeah. People might decide to go into sin. People could get into fornication. People could get into adultery. People could even murder. People could do all manner of sin. People could forsake church. People could get lazy. People could stop doing this. But you know what a saved person won't do? A saved person won't leave here and just start denying Jesus Christ. Right. Won't just deny the Son. Won't deny you know the, the true gospel if they were saved. Yeah. If they were saved, if they believed on Jesus Christ, if they've known the truth, they're not going to just walk out here and just start preaching a bunch of heresy. It's not going to happen. No. That's what the Bible's teaching us. Amen. That's what the Bible's warning us about. He's saying, look, when someone is in your church, in Bayport Baptist Church, and they go out and they start teaching a, another gospel, it just proves they never really believed the right gospel. Now, I'm not saying that you couldn't get caught up in some heresy of some, some sort, that you couldn't believe something wrong, that you couldn't be taken in a fault. Obviously, we see churches having heresies in the Bible. We have people that, you know, make shipwreck the faith. But we don't have them going out denying who Jesus Christ really is, denying the Son, denying that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and that they were saved. That's what the Bible's teaching us. There's certain core doctrines of the faith. There's certain things that are just a saved person is not going to deny. And that's what the Bible's teaching us here. He that can, it, it, look, look back at chapter 4, verse 3. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. What exception does it have there? Zero. Yeah. It's saying this guy obviously is not saved. This guy is an antichrist. There's no bones about it. Go if you would to uh, 2 John. Let's look at 2 John for a moment. Look at verse uh, 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father and truth and love. Look at verse 7. For many deceivers are entered in the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So again we see that same phrase. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. But we're quantified with who Jesus Christ is in this book. It tells us who Jesus Christ is. Who is He? Well, let's go back and read it again. Let's look at verse 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. So if they deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, who do they deny? They deny that the Son of the Father came in the flesh. It's very clear. If somebody other than the Son of the Father came in the flesh, they don't believe it. That's right. And look at verse number 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now, in our church, we have ran into this, this rank heresy about eight months ago, where people, they deny the Trinity. They deny that God is three persons. They deny that there's God the Father, there's God the Son, Jesus Christ, and there's God the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost of God. And you say, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a doctrine. It doesn't attack anything major in the Bible. No. It attacks the fact that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Because those that believe this doctrine, they do not believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. They believe somebody else came. You know, they believe, they believe the Father came in the flesh. Now go, if you would, to... Uh, Go if you went to John chapter 1. Now I got some uh, aids for you today to help drill in this doctrine. Okay? So what I have right here is just a basic drawing. Forgive me if my drawing's not perfect. But basically what we believe the Trinity looks like. 
maybe on paper. Right. You know, I'm not going to draw like a picture of what God looks like. This is just kind of an abstract concept of what the Trinity would look like. Okay, we have a Father who is one person. We have Jesus Christ the Son who is one person. And we have the Holy Ghost who is one person. And collectively, they make God. Now, we believe Jesus Christ is God. We believe the Father is God. We believe the Holy Ghost is God. Collectively, they are God as well. And what do we believe? We believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh. We do not believe God the Father came in the flesh. We do not believe the Holy Ghost came in the flesh. We believe the Son of God, the Son of the Father, Jesus Christ, came in the flesh. Now, this is what oneness believes. <laughs> they believe in this just one singular spirit called Jesus. They believe this is the Word, this is God. Every, every word that's used for God can be substituted with Jesus and can be substituted for each other. And you know, these three people that got kicked out of earth, there are like four or five people, mainly our deacon named Tyler Baker. He does not believe in the Trinity. He made that very clear. Now, what they'll try to say is they'll say, well, we don't believe in oneness Pentecostalism. We don't believe that doctrine. But they do believe that doctrine. And I'm going to read for you from Wikipedia what that doctrine, what it says, and how that is exactly what he said and what he believes. It says, oneness Pentecostalism derives its distinctive name from its teaching on the Godhead, which is popularly referred to as the oneness doctrine. This doctrine states that there is one God, a singular divine spirit, who manifests himself in many ways, including as a father, a son, and a Holy Ghost. This stands in sharp contrast to the doctrine of three distinct and eternal persons posited by the Trinitarian theology. One is believers baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, commonly referred to as Jesus' name baptism. Rather than using the Trinitarian formula, it is somewhat similar to Sabellianism. So the Bible is saying, or so what they believe is that there's just one spirit who can manifest himself in any kind of, in many ways. But according to the Bible, he manifests himself as a father, as a son, as a Holy Ghost. And you say, well, I don't see those here. Well, according to these guys, they don't believe, listen to me now, they don't believe that Jesus Christ existed before Bethlehem. Yeah. They do not believe that the Son of God existed until He was born a virgin in the garden. So in Genesis 1-1, this is their idea of God. When Abraham appears unto, or when God appears unto Abraham, this is what they believe God is. They still believe this is what He looks like. Okay? We'll get a little bit further into it. But 1 John chapter number 3 uh, Go, go back to 2 John if you would. I, I think I had you turn somewhere else. Yep. Keep your finger in 1 John, or keep it to your finger in John chapter 1, but go back to 2 John 2. My first point is Jesus Christ is the Son. Okay, we've read a lot of verses on that. I just want to read a few more real quick to just drive that point in. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible reads, And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. We read that earlier. 2 John chapter 1, verse 3 Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. So that's what we saw here. The Son of the Father is the one that came in the flesh. And we see, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. But he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. Now here's my question. Let's read that verse with modalism in mind. Okay? Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. Now that doesn't make any sense. What, what are the both here? I don't even see it. What are they talking about? It doesn't even make any sense. But go back to John chapter 1 now. So my first point is that Jesus Christ, when it says Jesus Christ came in the flesh, we must believe that that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It can't be somebody else. Otherwise you're believing another Jesus and you don't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. But look at John chapter 1. Look at verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared it. Now here's another point. Jesus Christ saw God the Father. He saw God the Father. Now, if Jesus Christ did not exist before Bethlehem, okay, so we'll go back to this. Jesus Christ saw the Father. Now that doesn't make any sense. 
Right. It doesn't happen because he doesn't even exist yet. They couldn't have seen him. We see this is what they believe happened. Okay? I'll, we'll move on. Here's their picture of God. We have Abraham, timeline still this God. But then at Bethlehem, their God morphs into a son and a father and a Holy Ghost. Okay? But how could this son have seen the Father? He didn't even exist yet. Right. He's on this earth. Right. And he hasn't even seen him. Go to John chapter number 6. So one of the second points that we can know who Jesus Christ is, Jesus Christ, he saw the Father before he was on this earth. Now somebody might throw this stupid idea, oh, maybe he saw a vision. You know, maybe it was like Abraham, he saw the back parts of the Father. I'll prove that wrong in a minute. But look at John chapter 6, verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught, all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He says, Jesus Christ saw the Father. Now in the Trinity picture, the eternal, the eternal state of God, which never changes, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He saw the Father when He was up in heaven, didn't He? Yeah. He was still in heaven, according to John chapter number 3. Right. But we see here, in this morph, when they believe that Jesus became the Son of God, out of their own mouth, this is what they said. They said, the Father came down and became the Son. They say, in, in Matthew chapter 1, the Father came down and became the Son. And we see this morphed version of of the oneness God. <clears throat> now look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8 with verse 38. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. He's saying, look, you Jews that don't believe on me, you've seen what your father's done, the devil. I'm doing what I saw of my father, God in heaven. Look at John chapter 8 verse 54 now. You say, well, maybe while he was on this earth he just saw a vision. Maybe the oneness is true. Maybe he just saw him later after he was born. But look at verse 54. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Now how in the world in this picture can you say that he's not honoring himself? I mean, it's just one. It's just kind of morphed a little bit. He would be a liar if that was true. He says, look at verse 55, Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, keep his saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, before Abraham, did the son exist in the modalist viewpoint? No, he didn't. It's a lie. What about the Trinity formula? He's always existed. Yeah. He's always been the Son of God. He's always been the, third, the second person of the Trinity. We can see how it makes sense that He was there. We see that He's not glorifying Himself. The Father is glorifying Jesus Christ. We see that Jesus Christ could see the Father. There is no Jesus Christ finally came into existence at, at Bethlehem. That's false. That's a wicked doctrine. Go to Philippians chapter number 2. It says in John chapter 17, I'll read for you, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So it says that Jesus Christ had glory with the Father, not only before Abraham, before the world. Right. Now how in the world did he have glory with the Father, if this is true? He couldn't. It wouldn't even make sense with this. It makes sense here. He had glory with the Father before the foundation of the world. We have in John chapter 17, verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. So who has sent? Well, according to them, the Father sent himself to become the Son. 
When the Bible says that Jesus Christ didn't send himself, the Father sent Jesus Christ. Again, we have the picture of the Trinity. We have the fact that the Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world. Now, how can this blob... I mean, they believe the blob just loved itself. I mean, they just believe... G oh, I just have love with myself. That's what they have to believe. But not only that, Jesus has a different name than the Father. It's not just this one blob that's all called Jesus. It's not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that name is Jesus. That's what Tyler was going to baptize. That's what he said in his video, proving that he believes in oneness. I mean, that was the whole oneness in that one little phrase right there. I mean, they believe in one spirit named Jesus, and that's what they're going to baptize in. That would be their picture of Jesus. But look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name, which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ was given a name from the Father. Now, if, if this is your name, okay, before, and then you come down to be the Son, how can you be given this name? It's already your name, according to oneness. They already believe that it's Jesus. They already believe these things. But if He's given him a name, it makes more sense that the Word became flesh, known as Jesus Christ. He was given a name by the Father. Go, if you would, to John chapter 5. Now, in Proverbs, it's interesting. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 30, it says, Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, right. if thou canst tell? Yep. Now, how does that make any sense in oneness? They believe that it's the same name. <laughs> but in the Trinity, it's clear. We have the, his name, and we have what is his son's name. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is his son's name. That's who came in the flesh. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Look at John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. I can of my own self do nothing. I mean, how could oneness even be true? It's a wicked false doctrine. It, de it denies everything about who God is. But Jesus Christ is saying, I of my own self can do nothing. Meaning what? He's the, they're, they're, they together collectively make God. Yeah. We see that they all work together. We see that Jesus Christ doesn't do His own will. He does the Father's will. Look at uh, 31. If I bear witness of myself... My witness is not true. How can that be true in oneness? It can't. Look at, skip down for a sake of time. Look at verse 37. And the Father Himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. So you have the Father Himself. He's doing what? He sent me. He's bearing witness of me. He's the one that's teaching me what to do. We see the persons of the Godhead. We see that it is expressed by He, Him, Himself. We see that Jesus Christ is the express image of His person. We see that there's a distinction between these. And it's not just a, oh, we morphed into this goofy blob that looks a little bit different. You know, and they might even say, well, these would come off and kind of separate. They would kind of like be independent blobs. But again, now you don't have Jesus Christ being the eternal Son of God. You don't have Him existing before the foundation of the world. You become just morphing into whatever. Morphing into what? Buddha and Krishna and whatever they want to at this point. I mean, what's to stop him from morphing into something else? And even one of them thought that. They thought he could maybe appear in whatever form he wants. He just chooses to be a son, a father, and a holy ghost. Well, that's wicked and blasphemy. No, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is always the Son of God. So when we say Jesus Christ came in the flesh, it's not a blob that just decided to become a son that came in the flesh. No, it's the Son of God that has always existed that came in the flesh. Look at verse 43. I am come in my Father's name. If you receive me not, if another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Now, let's stop for a second on this verse. Okay, He's saying, I came in my Father's name. 
You say, what does that mean? Well, I guess it's oneness. Because he came in the Father. The Father's Jesus. They're all Jesus. He came. No. What that means is he's saying on behalf of. Right. Or in the authority of. Right. And we're going to prove right. that. Go, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 <laughs> Samuel number 17. The Bible says in Luke 20 verse 13, Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So when the son of the vineyard comes, he's going to come what? In the name of his father. He's coming on behalf of the father. He's representing the father. That's why you can say, I'm not coming in my own name. I'm not coming in my own volition. I'm not coming because of my will. I'm coming because my father told me to come, and I am come in the name of my father. That's not his name. It's his father's name. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 44. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee in my hand, and I will smite thee, and will take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Right. So you see what did David say? I am come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Oh, I guess David's name is God. I guess David's name is the Lord of hosts. No, he's saying he's coming in behalf of. He's coming in the authority of. He's coming to represent the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Who did Jesus Christ come in the name of? Of the Father. He came to represent the Father. He came in the authority of the Father. He came by the commandment of the Father. He did not come in his own name. Oh, wait. Let's go back to one. Oh, one that says it is Jesus. They're all Jesus. They all just believe it's Jesus. False. Right. Yeah. Wrong. No. Go to Acts chapter 2. Yeah. I think that point was pretty clear. Not only does he have a different name, we they say, well, yeah, but in Acts, you know, they baptize in Jesus' name. You know, the thing that's really stupid about this is they think that there's just this clear verse in Acts. Wrong. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if one were to take a very foolish interpretation of this scripture, a wrong interpretation of the scripture, they would say, you're supposed to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, right? That's the phrase that you would say. Well, go to Acts chapter number 8. So we say, we're supposed to say the name of Jesus Christ. That's, the, that's what we're supposed to say. Well, let's look at Acts chapter 8, verse 16. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So now it's different. Because at first he said, hey, you're supposed to name in Jesus Christ. Now it's in the name of Lord Jesus. So which one is it? Is it the name of Jesus Christ? Or is it the name of the Lord Jesus? Let's keep going with this stupid argument. Go to Acts chapter number 10 now. Go to Acts chapter number 10, verse 48. And he commanded them to be baptized... In the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry him certain days. Wait a minute. Was it we're supposed to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ? No. Then he said, baptize in the Lord Jesus? No. Nope. Now we're just supposed to baptize in the Lord. So which one is it? Right. It's because they're not telling you the literal words that you're saying when you're baptizing him. They're all referencing the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go back to Acts chapter number 19. Acts chapter number 19. So we see, they said in the name of Jesus Christ, then they said in the name of the Lord Jesus, then they said just in the name of the Lord. I mean, I've never heard of anybody just baptizing the name of the Lord. Is that Oh, that's what they did. That must be right. Look at Acts chapter 19, verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So now we're going back. I mean, they couldn't figure it out. They're like, was it the name of Jesus? You know, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, or just the Lord? I mean, it's all over the place. Okay. And then you're going to just say, oh, I think just the last one they did, that must be the one that we're supposed to do. How about what Jesus Christ said? Right. Baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. End of sentence. Yeah. Not, and that name is Jesus. 
False. We already figured it out. Jesus Christ is the name of the Son. He's the name that was given to Him by the Father. He was come in His Father's name. He didn't come in His own name is what the Bible teaches. Go to John chapter 5 again. So we're just kind of driving this in. Why? Because it's so important to understand who Jesus Christ is. Because if you don't understand who Jesus Christ is, I think you might gloss over 1 John chapter number 4. You say, oh, everybody claims that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Wrong. There's plenty of people that would change who Jesus is. Who would change facts about what that says. And they are, according to the Bible, anti-Christ. Right. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. Amen. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Amen. Now, it's, they're going to come it's going to be subtle. It's going to seem like they're your brother. It's going to seem like you're their friend. He's warning you about deceivers. He's warning you about seducers. The Bible says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now you say, what do you think about these people? You think they're just the most wicked, you know, you know, God-hating people in their hearts? I honestly think most of them are just deceived. They literally believe what they're saying. They literally believe their stupid false doctrine. They literally believe that, you know, a false thing about Jesus Christ. I think many of them, they're just deceived. They've just been given strong delusion. For whatever reason. I, I don't know what the reason is necessarily. I don't know what in their heart just makes them not want to believe what the Bible really says. But they don't have the Spirit of God. They're an antichrist. They're replacing Jesus with who? They're replacing Him with this block. They don't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. They believe the Father came to be the Son. They believe this, this morph them came. That's denying that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Look at John chapter number 5. This is the next point. He was sent by the Father. This is super clear in the Bible. I mean, I couldn't even show you every verse just for a whole sermon of how many verses about the Father sending the Son. Look at John chapter 5, verse 21. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom He will. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son... Honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. So who sent the Father? Who sent the Son? The Father. Go to John chapter number five now. John or John chapter number seven. I'm sorry. John chapter seven. Flip over two chapters. Look at verse twenty-eight. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, "Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not." Did Jesus Christ come of himself? Nope. Did he become the Son? No, he was sent by the Father. John chapter 17. I know we're kind of going to some of the same places over and over, but I think it's important to drive in this point. Why? Because deceivers and antichrists come in and they're believable. Because you want to believe them. Because you want to be on their side. I mean, we see the disciples when they're standing there with Judas Iscariot and Jesus Christ. Boy Blank says, look, when he dips his hand with me in the water, he's the betrayer. And they literally see it and they still don't understand He's like, hey, the guy that I dipped the sop and I hand it to him, he's the betrayer. And they're like, is it I? I mean, am I the betrayer? I mean, they just don't get it. And we see the, the deceivers and the people that are they're tricking them, they're believable. We see that Eve was tricked by the serpent. We see constantly through the Bible, believers being beguiled. Why? Because they don't have the Word of God firm on their heart. They don't believe the Bible. And we see, even we need to believe in the hard things. And you know what? It's, it's not fun to believe that there's Antichrist among us. It's not fun to think that there's a Judas in this room. It's not fun to think that there's a Judas in our church. It's not fun to think that there's somebody that denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's a horrible thought. We don't want that. But we need to be aware of these people so they would not seduce us. We see in 1 John chapter 2, he says, I've written these things for them that would seduce you. He's like, look, there's going to be people that will seduce you and draw you away from Christ and draw you away from the things of God. Look at John chapter 17, verse 25. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Hey, these disciples, they know that you sent me. They know that I came of you. Go to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. Famous verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at verse 17 now. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world through Him might be saved. God sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Very clear. Go back to 1 John chapter number 4. So, we've made it pretty clear that when this verse, it maybe seems, you know, innocent. It seems, oh, Jesus Christ has come to the flesh. That just means anybody that claims that Jesus Christ has come to the flesh is saved. Wrong. Now, obviously, you could apply this to a lot of different people. You could apply it to, obviously, anybody that just doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. But I think the immediate context, I think the immediate context of 1 John is clearly teaching us what? That there's false brethren in the church. There's false, you know, people that are among you. What's one of the ways you could determine who's false? One of the ways is the fact that he denies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. If we figure out, hey, this guy doesn't even believe that. He slipped up. This guy is believing this false doctrine. I mean, this guy must not be saved. And you know what confirms it? Confirms it is when they go out from among you and they're continuing in that folly. They're not just overtaken in a fault. They're not just, well, I kind of was not sure, I was a little hazy, or I was ignorant of some, some verses in the Bible, or I got kind of mixed up. No, they're just full-blown teaching that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. Now, they might say that, but they have another Jesus. Look at verse number uh, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He's saying, look, when you finally have one of these collisions, when you finally have one of these times where they just come out, this guy doesn't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, you're going to draw away the people, you're going to get some of the other Judases out. Because they're not going to hear you, they're going to hear them. Because they were of the world. They don't hear God's word. They don't hear us. They have the spirit of error. They do not have the spirit of truth. And they're going to follow after you know, the world's voice. The voice of the serpent. The, word, the voice of the Antichrist. Look at numbers, chapter number 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. And this was manifested, the love of God, toward us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. We're supposed to love one another in the church. And you know, even though there might be Judas Iscariots among us, even though there might be false brethren, we should just have love towards one another. We should just love one another. We should overlook the faults of one another. If one of us is overtaken in a fault, we should love that brother. We should try to restore that brother. Look at uh, chapter number 5, verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say you should pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So he's saying, look, if you see your brother sin, you should pray for him. You should want him to be restored. You should want him to, you know, come back in the church. You should want God to go, you know, soft on him, to be merciful on him. But what if someone goes out of the church and they're believing damnable heresy? Right. Don't pray for that guy. Right. Don't pray for the guy that sinned unto death. Don't pray for the heretic that's going to damn people to hell, right. that's believing a false gospel, right. that does not believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Do not pray for that guy. Amen. But pray for the brethren. Pray for those that are in the church. Pray for the believers. Hey, this guy, you know, he's transgressed against me. Pray for him. Love him. Treat him good. Do, do well unto him. People that say, oh man, you had misgivings about somebody and you never said anything. Yeah, because if I think he's a brother, I'm just going to pray for him. I'm going to love him. I'm going to cover a transgression. I'm not going to repeat a matter. I'm not going to go around and spreading, you know, everybody sins about everybody. Because you know what? I have plenty of faults too. I have plenty of sins too. I'm sure there's plenty of people that could be like, you know, Jonathan did this. And have you seen what he did there? And do you hear what he said there? I mean, there, we all have faults. We've all said wrong things. We've all done wrong things. We all have our own sin. We all have our own past. We shouldn't be going around spreading that. But look, the guy that gets out of here and just teaching wicked false doctrine... The guy that's an antichrist, you know, I'm not going to love him. I'm not going to pray for him. That's right. Go back to ch chapter 4. It says, look at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. Now, interestingly enough, 
these modalists will say that they believe no one's seen Jesus Christ. They take 1 Timothy chapter number 6 way out of context. And they say, oh, no man's ever seen Jesus Christ. No, 1 Timothy chapter 6 clearly teaches that no man has seen the light which Jesus Christ was there dwelling, dwelling in. But we see that ever, plenty of people saw Jesus Christ. Right. Jesus Christ came unto this earth. He preached unto tons of people. We see all, one of the signs of an apostle is that you saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. Right. So what does it mean here that no man has seen God anytime? It's talking about the Father. It's talking about someone different. It's talking about another person. Look at the rest of that verse. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that what? The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Who came to be the Savior? The Son. It just draw. I mean, it just says it over and over and over and over. The Father sent the Son. The Father did not become the Son. The Father is not the Son. The Father sent the Son. <coughs> Let's keep going. Look at verse chapter 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Does that say whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Father? Jesus is just all of, all of the, the three persons? No. That Jesus is the Son of God. It's making it clear from before the verse that we looked at and after the verse that Jesus is who? The Son. So if you say that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, what you're saying is that the Son of God came in the flesh. He came down from heaven. He did not start in Bethlehem's manger. And the Bible makes it clear He was begotten when He was raised again from the dead. That's what it means by begotten. Look at verse uh, number 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness of the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love Him because He first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment that we have from him, that he who loves God, love his brother also. Now I like verse 18, and we'll kind of finish on this point. You say, well, if there is Judas among us, if there is false brethren, if there is people that would betray us, you know, I'm going to kind of guard myself. I'm going to kind of withdraw from people. I don't want to get burned. I don't want, you know, to make friends with somebody and to love somebody and to care for them and then find out that they're a Judas. But you know what the Bible says in verse chapter 18? There is no fear in love. Yeah. You know, we're not supposed to fear loving the brethren. We're not supposed to fear loving the church. We're not supposed to fear loving one another. We should love one another with a complete and total love we should have boldness to just love the brethren and know, hey, but Judas goes out from among us. There's no fear in love. You know, he, I don't have to worry about that because I can overcome. Look at, Go back up. Look at verse number, look, look at number four. You're of God, little children, and I've overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He comforts those. Hey, look, you've overcome these antichrists. You've overcome those that would say that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh. Don't have any fear to love the brethren. Don't have any fear to love the church. Don't have any fear to, you know, love every person that is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We should have perfect love towards our brethren, just like we would towards the Father, whom we've not seen. We've not, no man has seen the Father. How could you say that you love the Father you've never seen if you can't love your, your fellow man, your fellow brother in Christ, the fellow guy that you see here, who says struggles, who has sins, who has needs, who has all kinds of things that we can help one another, we can pray for one another, we can do good unto one another. And even though there may be Judases among us, even though there may be false brethren, even though people may get kicked out of the church for being a Daniel heretic, we should still have love towards one another. And we should not fear to love one another. Because we've overcome them. Does that make sense? Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for sending Jesus Christ to come in the flesh and to die on the cross for all of our sins. I pray that we would all understand the clear doctrines of the Bible, the core doctrines of the Bible, so that we could understand, hey, we need to have love for the brethren. And even though there may be false brethren in this room or in our church, or that we may come across, or that we may, you know even uh, trust at some point in our lives that there's, there's no fear in love. 
And we can love them because we've overcome them. And we'll just cast them out. And we'll have new brethren that will come in their place. I just pray that you would just continue to protect us as much as possible from these wicked false teachers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.